Good morning. I'm, and isn't it a good morning? We've all had an extra hour of sleep. Look how bright and happy you look. You're the smart ones that changed your clocks last night. Um, I'm Marilyn Gay, and I'm happy to be the service leader this morning. Um, we welcome you to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. We are a liberal, religious, multi-generational congregation. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, pursue the common good, and work for justice. We believe in the compassion of the individual heart, the warmth of community, and the search for meaning in our lives. Our land acknowledgement today comes from Chief Wilton Littlechild, who was, uh, who responded to a request from the Edmonton Oilers to write something that they could use as their land acknowledgement. So if you're Oilers fans, you may hear this another time. We gather on Territory 6, the Treaty Territory 6. This land has been the traditional region of homelands of the Métis people of Alberta, the Inuit, the ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blacksmith, Blackfoot, <laughs> Salto, <laughs> and Nakata, Nakata Sioux people since time immemorial. The recognition of our history on this land is an act of reconciliation, and we honor those who walk with us. Chief Wilton Littlechild. Please prepare your hearts and minds for an hour of uh, special experiences and words and ideas by quieting any devices you may have that could distract us and also quieting your minds. We'll now listen to the prelude. Thank you, Gordon.
Good morning. That was awful. Come on. Good morning. There. There. That's better. Yeah. Thank you. We're awake. We got an extra hour of sleep, like Marilyn said. <sighs> Some of us did, right, Gordon? <laughs> Thank you the, for the prelude. It was beautiful. I would like to add my welcome to Marilyn's and uh, thank you, Marilyn, for being our service leader this morning. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison and it is my honor to be in service to this congregation. Some of you may know that we are using the Soul Matters program. It's a, it's, we get packets every month and, that, and it gives us kind of an idea. It helps us shape the services for the year. And this month, the theme is Holding History. So today I'm going to be talking about and introducing you to an important figure in the history of universalism. So we are Unitarian Universalists. Next week, we'll be talking about the difficulty people of color have historically had integrating into and becoming leaders of our congregations. The Reverend Mark Morrison Reed has published a body of work that I will be drawing from. He's done an incredible amount of history, um, published an incredible amount of history uh, regarding black um, and people of color, uh, their difficulties becoming ministers, uh, getting ordained, getting called, becoming leaders in our denominations. Thinking about our monthly themes again, I am hoping that next year we will be able to have small groups formed that will explore these themes deepen, deeper and it will augment our Sunday services. So there's a packet that comes out every month for our worship services for or Sunday services, whatever we call them here, and then um, for the RE program, the Religious Exploration Program, and then another a third packet comes out for small group work and the, those packets are really interesting i've led some of those groups in the past and they're they're really fun there's music and videos and practices it's it's a really great thing so i'm hoping we'll be able to do that next year but for now know that i am happy that you are here that you value being in this space together be it here in person or right now live on zoom or watching later on in the weeks or months ahead. My hope and prayer is that you find something of worth here this morning. And by the way, the word worship means, all it means is something of worth. That's all it means. It's not a word to be afraid of. My opening words this morning are from the elders of the Hopi Nation. To my fellow swimmers, here is a river now flowing very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid, who will try to hold on to the shore. They are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore push off into the middle of the river and keep our heads above water. And I say, see who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth and journey come to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. For we are the ones we have been waiting for. So now, let us begin. Let us worship together. 
And I would like to invite Marilyn Gay to read the chalice lighting words and Maria Jenkins to come up and light our chalice. Thank you. I asked Maria to bring any of the youth or children in our program. Maria is our interim director of religious exploration and she has a batch of Play-Doh waiting for happy hands to come in the future Sundays. So thank you. This is the reading from, by Heather K. Genuels. Our prophets died for the freedom of faith. We are here in their spirit. We are here to practice and sustain our living tradition, to light a chalice claiming for justice the heat and power of fire. In our free faith, we are here. Seeking freedom from despair, the freedom to be loved as ourselves, and the freedom to grow beyond imagination. We are here, gathered in the name of all that we find holy. Let us give thanks for the gift of gathering here. Thank you, Maria. Now, we're going to sing a hymn. And the hymn that um, we're going to begin our morning with is number 134. I don't have to tell you which hymn book. We're only using one today. So when the music begins, please rise as you are able or willing. And we'll sing together. One. Three, four. different ages, aren't we? We can hear a story. I was going to bring the little stand out and have it. I can't stand on my spot. I'm supposed to stand here, but I can't. I have to stand here. Is that going to work for you guys? Thumbs up. Yay. Sometimes I just don't do it the same as I'm supposed to do it in the rehearsal. This story was loosely, is loosely adapted from a story that George Rivas wrote in the 1940s when he was the assistant super superintendent of schools in the Cincinnati public school system in the 1940s. And I'm not going to pretend it's a story you haven't heard before because we've all heard an iteration of this story. And this particular iteration is written by Devorah Green, Greenstein. Many years ago, the animals of the great forest decided that they wanted to start a school for all of their students and all the children. Until that time, it had been the responsibility of the parents to look after the education of their children. 
But the animals in the great forest wanted their children to learn from professional teachers. So they organized a school and hired a staff. The teachers decided that they would produce a standardized curriculum and that they would have standardized tests for all of their children. So they adopted an activity curriculum consisting of swimming, running, flying, and climbing. All the students took all the classes because it was very important to the parents that no child be left behind, you see. So to ensure the students were progressing properly, they did in, in administer the same test to all of the students. Well, here's what happened. So the ducks, as you can well imagine, were very, very good at swimming, but not so good at running or climbing. And, you know, they were a little bit slow, and they weren't great flyers either, but, you know, that was okay if you've ever seen ducks. They're not super flyers, but they can sure darn swim. So, but because they were so slow in running, they had to stay after school and practice running, and they had to actually practice running during the swimming class, too, because they were already really, really good at swimming, so they didn't need to go to swimming class, right? So they, they practice and practice their running until their poor little web feet got so sore that they couldn't even swim anymore. Oh. And they, but, you know, so they became very average in swimming, but nobody really cared about that. Well except the ducks. Well, and then the rabbits come along, and they, they, they're, they're, they're really good at running, and they're at the top of the class for running. But they insist on ro hopping around, and, and they can't walk slowly. They just hop and hop and hop and hop all over the place. And the teachers were kind of concerned about their hyperactivity because, you know, they were like hop, 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 all over the place. And so they made the rabbits walk, instead of hop. They couldn't hop or jump or anything. And, and they were really bad at swimming. So the teachers made them stay, like they had to come in early for extra swimming lessons. And, and then they started to have trouble with their fur. Because like they were, and they were getting little rashes and things. And their fur, their skin, it was awful. It was poor little rabbits. Anyways, they did not like spending so much time in the swimming pool. Now the squirrels, they were excellent in climbing and running. In fact, the students, the, the squirrels were the best students in climbing the standardized tree, but they, if they, they weren't that good at flying. But, and, but you know what, they, they figured out, you know, you've seen squirrels fly and they go to the top of the tree and they sort of fly out, you know, they push their paws out and they, they can fly, fly over to different trees and they, and it's really quite beautiful to watch. But the teachers decided that they needed to start the flying from the ground. Right? So they made them go to the gym every day and do little strengthening exercises for their little pods so that they could figure out how to fly from the ground. And they weren't, so they weren't allowed to climb to the top of the tree to fly. They had to start at the ground. But then, but then their little paws and their little arms got so sore from, from doing all this extra exercise that they couldn't even climb the trees anymore. And, and they got, you know, the best they could get was a C. And some of them even failed climbing. And these were the best climbers. Well, and then the eagles, they were the problem children. In the climbing class, the eagles insisted on flying to the top of the tree. And the teachers were saying, no, 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 you've got to climb the tree. You've got to climb the tree. But the ins eagles, they insisted on using their own way to get there. And they were quite stubborn about it. So guess what happened to them? <laughs> the eagles said clearly that it was the goal that mattered and that they were quite right for eagles. And it was quite right for eagles to get to the top of the tree by flying. The school psychologist, the school psychologist uh, diagnosed all of them with oppositional defiant disorder. <laughs> and a strict behavior modification plan was developed for them. We can end this story in different ways. 
Sad to say, we in school, we still make some children, some squirrel children, try to learn to fly by going to the gym and lifting weights, or punish eagles for being defiant about their right to be themselves. And we do that with adults too, I think, not just children. But happy to say in some schools, we enjoy all children for themselves, just being themselves, and I hope that we do that here with each other as well. Each squirrel is a perfectly wonderful squirrel. Each rabbit, a lovely little rabbit, whether or not they choose to hop or skip or roll or walk. Each eagle is allowed to be an eagle, and we encourage each duck to swim and swim and swim and not worry about learning to run. And the moral of the story is, of course, when we try to make everybody the same, no one's happy. And people can get hurt, and their very best gifts can go to waste. And I would like to add that I think as we begin to explore what adding the eighth principle means to our denomination, that we keep this story in mind. I wonder if we be need to begin questioning our need to have everything looking at, that everything we're looking at and doing things the same as they've always been done. I wonder, how do we make ourselves more welcoming and accepting of those that don't look like us or act like us? Just something to think about. Thank you. That was a lovely story and very meaningful in our present times to think that it was written more than half a century ago. And it's still so true. Ah, new topic. Our community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. In addition to supporting this church community, we also make a monthly commitment beyond our walls, one half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. Some are local, some national, some international. And for the month of November, we're sharing our abundance with the CBC Turkey Drive. You know that the Turkey Drive is um, a program in conjunction with the food bank to provide um, festive meals and necessary meals for people who um, have limited circumstances. Um, baskets are going to be, well, are, near the ex at sides of the sanctuary where your contributions can be placed at the end of this service. Or if you prefer, or if you're on Facebook, um, you can donate online to the CBC Turkey Drive by going to the cbc.ca website and follow the prompts. Now we'll sing the words that are printed in your order of service or the ones that you probably know. And um, if you want to look it up in your hymnal, it's number 402. going to sing another hymn and this is one of the favorites of the raging grannies in the congregation and um, it's number 402 oh no it's number one 109 in your hymnal as we come marching marching or as some of us call it bread and roses
So does everyone have a hymn book? Put up your hand if you don't have a hymn book, and maybe somebody will bring you one. Does anybody not have a hymn book? So you'll need to open it and have the words to hum three number, number 352 open and on your lap for the meditation hymn, Find a Stillness. So here's the way the meditation is going to be, what going to go. I'm going to invite you into a time of stillness and reflection, meditation, just to center ourselves, and get into our bodies, so to speak. And then I'm going to read a small excerpt from um, a piece called Raven, Teach Me to Ride the Winds of Change by Margaret Wheatley. I'm going to read it two or three times. It's very short with a little pause in between. It's full of beautiful imagery. Then we'll have a small amount of silence, and then Gordon will begin to play Find a Stillness, and I invite you to join in with that. When we're finished singing the hymn, we're going to line up on this side, grab a candle, light it, light your candle, and then extinguish it in the little cup of water that's in the basket. And we have been doing this similarly every Sunday. So if you're not exactly sure what to do, don't go first. And then you can follow along. Okay. I invite you now to take a couple of deep cleansing breaths. And remember, this is by invitation, never a do or a die situation. I invite you to focus in on your breath and feel it enter your body. Your chest rises, and as it leaves you, your chest falls. And if you like, you could put your hands on your chest or your belly and feel your body opening to accept the air and then contracting as the air leaves. Now I invite you to feel whatever it is that is supporting you. Lean into it. Let it hold you. Know that you are supported. Raven, teach me to ride the winds of change. Perch where the wind comes at you full force. Let it blow you apart till your feathers fly off and you look like hell. Then abandon yourself. The wind is not your enemy. Nothing in life is. Go where the wind takes you higher lower, backwards. The wind, will, the wind to carry you forward will find you when you are ready, when you can bear it. Perch where the wind comes at you full force. Let it blow you apart till your feathers fly off and you look like hell. Then abandon yourself. The wind is not your enemy. Nothing in life is. Go where the wind takes you. Higher, lower, backwards. The wind to carry you forward will find you when you are ready, when you can bear it. Perch where the wind comes at you full force. 
Let it blow you apart till your feathers fly off and you'll look like hell. Then abandon yourself. The wind is not your enemy. Nothing in life is. Go where the wind takes you, higher, lower, backwards. The wind to carry you forward will find you when you are ready, when you can bear it. I invite you to light candles as you wish or feel called to do.
Ben, can I ask you to light a, a candle for all those joys and concerns we keep in our hearts? And as you do that, let us hold all of this. Every candle represents something, right? There's something that we've experienced, something that we long for, something that we are grieving. It is the manifestations of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. A little reading this morning also by Margaret Wheatley from her book Perseverance. And it's called It's Our Turn. Throughout human existence, there, has, there have always been people willing to step forward to struggle valiantly in the hope that they might reverse the downward course of events. Some succeeded, some did not. As we face our own time, it's good to remember that we're only the most recent humans who have struggled to change things. Getting engaged in changing things is quite straightforward. If we have an idea or want to resolve an injustice or stop a tragedy, we step forward to serve. Instead of being overwhelmed and withdrawing, we act. No grand actions are required. We just need to begin speaking up about what we care about. We don't need to spend a lot of time planning or getting senior leaders involved. We, we don't have to wait for official support, she says. Maybe around here we do. I don't know. We just need to get started for whatever issue or person we care about. When we fail, which of course we will, we don't have to feel discouraged. Instead, we look at our mistakes and failures for the valuable learnings they contain. And we can be open to opportunities and help that present themselves. Even when they're different from what we thought we needed. <laughs> we can follow the energy of yes, rather than accepting defeat or getting stuck in a plan. This is how the world always changes. Everyday people, not waiting for someone else to fix things or come to the rescue, but just simply stepping forward, working together, figuring it out, how to make things better. Now it's our turn. Thomas Starr King, the, a former governor of California and namesake of one of the two Unitarian Universalist seminaries, once said, the Universalists believe so remember, we're Unitarian Universalists. They were once two separate denominations. Not that long ago, 1961 was the merger. So the Universalists believe that God is too good to damn humanity, while the Unitarians believe that humanity is too good to be damned by God. <laughs> right? Therein lies the major theological difference between Unitarians and Universalists. Olympia Brown was a universalist. She believed in that good and loving God that held us all in love and kindness. And in the 19th century, when Olympia Brown lived, this was not the common belief. The fire and brimstone that the Calvinists taught was more in vogue, along with knowing one's place and lot in life. Olympia Brown's belief in her own capabilities while being supported by a benevolent higher being was the driving force behind this very driven woman. She was born in 1835 by, to Asa and Lafia Brown. They were from Vermont, but their ad adventurous souls had taken them to Michigan. There were no schools where they landed, so Olympia's father built a school on his property and then went around soliciting money and children. 
so <laughs> he, he wanted students and he wanted parents to pay for them, which was, somebody had to, right? Olympia went to that school and then later on to a nearby town, in, in, to in a nearby town she went to school, and then to a women's seminary in Massachusetts, and I'm not exactly sure what that would be because back then, of course, women weren't really working in the church. But she didn't like it there and ended up in Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And she loved it there. And her experience pr prompted her whole family to move to Yellow Springs. So mom, dad, three other kids, a couple of them girls, so that her three siblings could enjoy a good education. Okay, hold on, wait a minute. Did you just hear what I said? Let's think about that for a sec. Her parents moved their entire household on the account of their daughter in around 1850 to a new town so that their children could get a good education, most of them girls. In the mid-19th century, it wasn't considered necessary for a girl to even be educated, let alone move so that a female could get a good education. In looking at remarkable people and looking at their lives, people that have changed the course of history or made history like Olympia did, they don't appear out of thin air. Right? They, thinking about why, as a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we want to support families, this is one of the reasons. So that those with great vision can get the support and confidence they need to be able to live into that vision. How many Olympia Browns didn't get the support they needed and weren't able to live into their potential? One of my colleagues asked the question at a meeting of ministers one day. We get together sometimes and talk about things, usually our families and things. Anyway, so he asked, what is the theology of supporting families? Could the story of Olympia Brown be the basis for such a theology? And remember, a theology is just an idea. How would one articulate such a statement? Perhaps it could be something like, we support families so that the members of the families we serve receive what they need to live into their potential, thus making this world more just, equitable, and compassionate. It's a grand theological statement. Here's another one. Or how about... We support families because we want to encourage age-appropriate spiritual growth in society. In other words, we want families and individuals to have healthy relationships with one another and with themselves. That's good theology. That's another word we don't have to be afraid of. It's just ideas about how we are as people in this world living. While Olympia was at Antioch, that college her family moved to be closer to, she received her call to ministry. While there, she invited Antoinette Brown, not a relative, to lecture and preach. She says, it was the first time I heard a woman preach. And, in this, and the sense of victory lifted me up, she says. I felt as though the kingdom of heaven were at hand. She decided right there and then to go to theological school. And this is where her strength and perseverance really showed up. She knocked on many doors, was told by the Unitarian School in Meadville, Pennsylvania, that the trustees thought it would be too great an experience too great an experiment, pardon me, to admit a woman. Another theological school said that, well, she could attend classes, I, they guess, but not, but not participate fully. She wouldn't be allowed to speak in class. Her voice was not welcome. She then applied to St. Lawrence University, which is in Kansas. The pres president offered her admission, saying... I do not think that women were called to the ministry, but 
I leave that between you and the great head of the church. This, thought Olympia, was exactly where it should be left. And she believed strongly that the great head of the church was calling her to ministry, so she packed her bags and headed to the divinity school. And they were surprised to see her. They, in fact, they thought that they had discouraged her enough that she would stay home. She completed divinity school in 1863, but her battle to gain ordination was not over as she had to convince very reluctant ministers to ordain her. But she was ordained and was the first woman to be given full denominational privileges, I think in North America. I can't speak for Europe. It, this meant that she could be called to any universalist church, not just a single parish that saw fit to ordain a woman. In that case, she would only be able to serve in the particular congregation that had ordained her. It was a rough road, though. Most of the people she encountered at seminary did not give her the kind of support she had received from her parents. She was apparently heckled and made fun of for her voice in the higher register. There are stories of her co-students, all men. Of course, she would have been the only woman at seminary. Um, they, were, they would stand under her dorm window and mock her and say disparaging things to her. I can't imagine how unpleasant those years at seminary must have been for her. Seminary is difficult enough, believe me, and us, <laughs> we're nodding, <laughs> without being made fun of and without being told you don't belong. This is completely against what universalism is actually all about. Universalism is different from Unitarianism in a number of ways, as Thomas Starr King had said. However, the most striking is that Universalism has come out of a more long-standing Christian tradition. Some Universalists were Trinitarian. However, the main tenet of Universalism is that all are saved, therefore universal. That's where the universal comes in, universal salvation. A very heretical statement for the time. Because remember, everybody, you had to be saved to go to heaven. There was like this whole fire and brimstone thing going on at that time. What does that mean in terms of being part of this congregation, though, at this time? We'd use different language now. But So we could say, instead of universal salvation, that universalism is the idea that we are all worthy of love and belonging that we are already forgiven for our mistakes, and that we can be given a second chance over and over again. Or something like, all is never lost, and the transforming power of love is ever in our grasp. That's kind of how I would translate universalism to our, our more of our way of thinking and feeling. But back to Olympia. Olympia accepted her first call to ministry in Massachusetts in 1860-something. I think that's wrong. I think I have a typo. She, began, she became involved, but I'm forgiven over and over again, right? Right. <laughs> I'm allowed to make mistakes up here. Yay. And so she became involved with the women's rights movement and worked with Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and other leaders. In 1867, she was given a four-month leave of absence uh, from her ministry to go to Canvas to campaign for the passage of the Women's Suffrage Amendment. The vote did not pass, and of course, all the voters were men. But one-third of the voting men did vote to approve the amendment, so I think that's pretty big. She said she often had to face down hostile townspeople, but nevertheless, she persisted. She fought for this cause for the rest of her life. And as a Unitarian Universalist, we are no strangers to fighting for causes that make this world a more just and equitable place to be. 
Pete Seeger and his Peace and Justice songs come to mind, for one, a, a wonderful Unitarian that we have lost. Right now, and right now, the Canadian Unitarian Council and the Unitarian Universalist Association are working on adopting an eighth principle. How many of you have heard about this? Letter went out, right? I s personally, I see this principle as being important and as being an important social, social justice initiative. This message that recently went out to people, it said, on November 27th, there will be a special online CUC meeting, Canadian Unitarian Council, to vote on a proposed new Unitarian Universalist principle, the eighth principle. Our delegates will be there to vote on behalf of the congregation. The principle reads, we, the member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council, covenant to affirm and promote individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion in ourselves and our institutions. The proposed principle comes from the work of a CUC dismantling racism group study which concluded that Canadian UUs need a deeper commitment to action against racism and to, efforts and to efforts to make our congregations more diverse, just as Canada is becoming more diverse. In a letter to congregations earlier this year, the Canadian Unitarian Council President Margaret Wanlin called this eighth principle work an act of deep love for one another and our faith a deep act of love for one another and our faith. That sounds very universalist to me. And thank you, Susan Rattan, for leading us in this and to our three delegates who will be voting on our behalf, Susan Rattan, Audrey Brooks, and Louise Carriage. We do not need to look far to see areas of injustice, and sometimes it takes great courage and the support of community like Olympia had, to change history. However, right now we have an opportunity to make a difference. Just because we can't do everything doesn't mean we can't do something. And all those somethings add up. Our Universalist, Unitarian Universalist principles call us to the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. No small task. However, not all of us can fathom taking on the world community, but we can tackle the community that is our world. We can speak out against injustices, and we must speak out in whatever way we can. Sometimes that looks like having a conversation, learning more about something that is unjust, signing a petition, attending a march, or voting to adopt the eighth principle, and then making a con and then and then that's the first step only and then making a commitment to discover why we actually need it. More on that later. For Olympia Brown, she saw that half the population was vulnerable to power struggles, structures, half the population did not have a say in the running of the government, and she set out to do something about it. At the age of 53 and after many years of being a parish minister, a wife and a mother, she left ministry to devote her time and life to the suffrage movement in the United States. And of course, here in Canada, we had our own women that were on the forefront, and I think it was in Winnipeg that the, first, that the vote first happened in, in Manitoba with Nellie McClung at the lead. When Reverend Olympia Brown was 85, she was the guest preacher at her last parish in Racine, Wisconsin. There she said, the grandest thing has been the lifting up of the gates and the opening of the doors to women, giving liberty to millions of women, thus opening to them a new and larger life and a higher ideal. In this, what must have been a very meaningful sermon, she also said, the faith in which we have believed, for which we have worked and which has bound us together, dear friends, stand by this faith. Work for it and sacrifice for it. There is nothing in all the world so important to you as to be loyal to this faith 
which has placed before you the loftiest ideal, which has comforted you in sorrow, strengthened you for the noble duty, and made the world beautiful for you. There had been many changes since that she left ministry, and it was her privilege to vote in the 1920 presidential election. She was 85. But how can we interpret her words to make sense of them in our own context? We struggle with the word faith. What does that even mean? Why would we struggle and work for this faith? Hmm. I wonder if that within her own faith, believing in a deity, in something larger than herself, she felt buoyed up and strengthened. Perhaps we can think about how being in community helps, keeps us, keeps us feeling buoyed up and strengthened. Perhaps the encouragement and support we give one another makes a huge difference in our own courage and perseverance. What would it be like for you if you were not in this community? Are you ever comforted in sorrow here? Do you have those you can rejoice with or be friends with? How has being part of this community made the world a more beautiful place for you? The answers are many, and each person is going to have many answers to that question. May we be ever mindful that we hold each other in this community of strength, of belonging, of faith, whatever that means for each of us or not. That in being here, we are nurturing one another and our support and the quality of our interactions. That in being here, we are nurturing one another and our support and the quality of our interactions. That may be just what the courageous and persistent need to change the world. So may it be, and blessed be. Oh, and now we can sing our final hymn, number 354. We laugh, we cry. It's in the gray hymn book. Oh, it's the only one we got. Okay. We laugh, we cry, hymn number 354. Stand as you stand in body or spirit as you are willing and able. <laughs>
do this. Jealous Extinguishing Words are by Susan Osborne. I'm making my strong soldiers strong for the young to stand upon, stepping lightly on the backs of those who will hold me up. It's a chain of life unending, ever new and ever bending. Grateful is the heart for the chance to be alive. And our closing words are by Eric Williams. Blessed is the path on which you travel. Blessed is the body that carries you upon it. Blessed is your heart that has heard the call. Blessed is your mind that discerns the way. Blessed is the gift you will receive by going. Truly blessed is the gift that you will become on the journey. Go forth in peace. And I have some announcements, and they're over here. Okay, the Social Justice Working Group will meet here next Sunday after church. All are welcome. Uh, and um, there's going to be flu vaccines available and offered here by our member and uh, wonderful member, Michelle Vandermolen, a pharmacist. So next Sunday after church, and bring your friends. And choir practice is starting. Woo! Next th Thursday at 7.30, bring, bring your mask here in the sanctuary. And at 1 o'clock on Zoom, at the same link that you would go to church in, I'm, I'm going to host, um, I'll entertain questions on the 8th principle. If anybody has any questions, because we all have to vote, and if you have questions and wish to have a conversation, and it will be a friendly respectful conversation on Zoom at 1 o'clock. And I would like to uh, thank everyone that participated in, that came, that's here on Zoom. Thank you for being here um, and for your contributions. Thank you very, very much. And don't forget to drop off these little baskets at each door. Drop off your offering for sharing our abundance. We are so blessed and we get to share with the world. Okay, please, we get to sing Carry the Flame now. And uh, however you like to do it, just as I say, no touching. Go in peace.